Good to see you guys. I'm glad you're here. We're going to read out of Luke chapter 4, verses 1, 1 to 4. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Let's pray. God, this morning I woke up just so thankful that we can have joy in you. I don't know why, God, but I woke up very joyful. I thank you for that. I thank you, God, that we we have the opportunity to know you and that in your presence is fullness of joy. And that right here, God, because we're meeting in your name, that you are here in our presence and we are in yours. Holy Spirit, fall in this place and lead us into all truth like you promise us that you will do. God, I pray that, that we would give you an offering of praise this morning in which you would have joy and that we can worship you by, by steering our lives through the power of your Spirit to walk in accordance to your will. And I pray for other congregations in the many churches that we have that are meeting right now. God, that you would meet them where they're at. That your word would be spoken so powerfully, so truthfully. God, that we would know you. God, unite us as the body of Christ and lead us into all truth in Jesus' name. Amen. So in 2016, God moved us here from California to right here in Bonners Ferry. I say that God moved us here because after praying for like five years about whether we should move and a series of events that could not possibly have been coincidence, we saw the hand of God guide us to right here in Bonners Ferry. And so we moved, and we moved into a fifth wheel with a dog and an almost two-year-old. And it was awesome. Until it wasn't. (laughs) About two months in. And it turns out that living in a fifth wheel with a dog and a toddler is not at all like camping over the weekend. (laughs) And the job that I had taken was nothing like what I expected. And my wife's job was truly, truly Awful. Truly the worst job I've ever, no, not ever. It was really bad. And we tried so hard to make friends. But it it seemed like we couldn't make friends beyond people who were just trying to be friendly. And the friends that we had left in California were not nearly as devastated that we left as we hoped they would be. It turns out they weren't calling us every day with their disappointment that we were no longer in their lives and how desperately they missed us. And it turns out that they were doing just fine without us. And we started to question, God, did you even move us here? Why did you move us here? Did you move us here just to make us suffer? Because it kind of feels that way. Kind of of felt like, like maybe this wasn't for our good, didn't quite understand what in the world was going on. It, it, it felt kind of like, like God had, uh, had abandoned us a little bit and that we were in the middle of a wilderness. That was actually true because we were in a fifth wheel in the middle of a wilderness. Have you ever been in a wilderness? Everybody's been in a wilderness. There's not a person in here who at some point in their lives has not or will not go through a season in the wilderness. We all do. Some of you are like, man, I'm in a wilderness right now. An emotional wilderness or or a physical wilderness or a spiritual wilderness. When you're in a wilderness, it is very easy, abundantly clear, what we don't have. It is incredibly clear what we lack in a wilderness. And it can be really easy 
to think that God has abandoned us. It's really easy to wonder, why in the world am I here? Have you, have you forgotten about me? Do you even care about me? Did you make a mistake? Like we took a left turn? Now we're somehow in the middle of a wilderness? It's really easy to forget. God does some of his best work when we are in a wilderness. So when we read this in Luke chapter 1, or sorry, chapter 4, verse 1, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the led by the Spirit into the what? This might be new to you. Like this was new to me a little while ago, a few years ago. How many of you know that God can lead you into a wilderness on purpose? Why would a loving God do that? I don't want to go there. Me neither. It's hard there. It's not comfortable there. All the things that I'm used to relying on are not there. There's nothing there. Exactly. Sometimes we get so darn busy and distracted by work and with play and with life in general and all the stuff and all the things that it is nearly impossible for us to actually put our attention on God. Do you find that? I mean, I don't care whether you're retired or you have a job. We pack our lives so full of stuff that we are so easily distracted by what we've packed our lives full of that sometimes it's really hard to even put our attention onto God. But, much like you would pull a child away from distraction, because you love them and you want to direct them on the way to go, God teaches us so many things in the wilderness. Reliance on Him. Submission to Him. And patience. Testing us. And shaping us so that we can be used by Him for His will to His glory. So many things. But Brandon... If God never led me to the wilderness, then I wouldn't have the problems that I'm facing now. That's not the truth. Our seasons in the wilderness do not cause the problems we find while we're in them. Our seasons in the wilderness simply reveal the problems that are already there. It lays bare what's really going on in our hearts so that we can surrender it to our Savior and replace it with Him and reliance on Him. That we can can let go of our priorities and replace it with His presence. Then we can be led by the Spirit. So, He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being tempted for 40 days... By the devil. Now that's something. Jesus is led into the wilderness where where there's nothing. And then he's tempted by the devil. Some of you might be feeling pretty Christ-like. Like, Like, that's exactly what's happened to me. I am in desolation. And I'm face to face with the devil. Alone. It's really easy to equate wilderness and abandonment. That's not true. That's not what God does. God loves us. Yeah. He will pull you into a place where you can easily focus on Him, or at least more easily focus on Him, but He never abandons us. He never leaves us alone, and you are never outside of His presence. Oh, I love, I love this psalm. It's 139. I, I absolutely love it. Um, I read over verses 7 to 10 in Psalm 139, and, and you, can, you can feel you, you can feel this. Where can I go from your spirit? 
Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Behold, you. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. You are never outside of the presence of God. Even when we feel like it. I love that song that we just sang. He's still working. He is the way maker. He will make a way even in your wilderness because he never leaves you. And even as we're tempted, he has that under control. He gives you the power to overcome it by the Holy Spirit that he has given to you. And he gives you the word. Jesus Christ himself is about to quote the word of God. He is God. He's about to quote the word of God in the middle of his temptation. Oh, if we aren't studying the Word of God and memorizing Scripture, we are fighting temptation blindfolded with both arms tied behind our back. And we are going to get punched right in the face. Because as we face temptation, the Holy Spirit will bring that to your mind. He will cause Scripture to come into your head, the things that you have spent time studying, the things you have spent time memorizing. And in the midst of our temptation, He will bring that in there. It's one of the ways that God gives us to overcome the temptation that's trying to drown us. And He does give us ways. Just listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. He will give you more than you can handle. He will give you that so that we learn to rely on Him because He can handle everything. But He will not tempt you, not let you be tempted more than you are able. Beyond what you are able, you are, what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You know it doesn't seem that way when you're super hungry, right? And and, and you're facing the lack of what you don't have when you're hungry for the things that you don't have. The rest of verse 2. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. Would Jesus have been tempted in the very next verse if he did not have a lack of food. Jesus wouldn't have been tempted if he didn't have a lack of food. That's what happens in the wilderness, is that we feel the lack. It's so easy to focus on on what we don't have. One of God's goals for us in the wilderness is that in our apparent lack, we would reach out. And when there's nothing around us beside God, when we reach out, we would find Him. And when we find Him, we would realize that by finding Him, we lack absolutely nothing. It's one of God's goals. So, but wait. Why doesn't God just give us everything? So that we lack absolutely nothing. So, so that every, every one of our, our, our desires, which are impure, by the way, a lot of the times, are always satisfied forever. That way we never have to reach out and therefore are never tempted. You know, I think that might be an even harder temptation. That we're, that we're so comfortable. We're so provided for. We're so rich that we are tempted to never reach out beyond what we have. And maybe never find God. That is one of Satan's goals for your wilderness. That you would believe 
that you can't rely on God or that you don't have to. That in your apparent lack, you would reach out and you would grab hold of something besides God and never grasp hold of Him. You would never learn that you can fully rely on Him. Maybe you're in a wilderness right now. And you're, you're feeling the lack. lack of a, I know some of you have just a lack of a job. No job. Or maybe a lack of a job that you actually like. That fills you up. Lack of relationships or even connection that edifies you and builds you up, but only connections that make you feel even more empty. Anybody have those relationships? You spend time and you leave there in a worse place than you. No one's going to admit to that, right? Because you're <laughs> maybe it's someone in here who, who you have relationships with. It leaves you empty. You're feeling even more disconnected. That's where Satan is going to push you. In areas that you don't have, that you feel the lack, so that you reach out and you grab hold of something that's not God. That's where he pushes us. So in verse 3, the devil said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. So what did Jesus say? He said, you're right. Yeah, God's starving me. This has no purpose. Beyond God's mean desire to make me suffer, what I deserve has been wrongfully withheld. Does Jesus do that? No. No, he doesn't blame God for the circumstances in which he finds himself. That's super easy to do. You ever do that? I've done it. Absolutely. Man, God, start blaming God for, for, where, for where you are, even where... Because even when where you are is because of this, the decisions that, that you have made. I've done that. That's super easy. God, why'd you put me here? Well, you, you made some, some choices that put you there. Well, why'd you let me make those choices? I've done that. That's super easy. Don't worry. God's still there. He's still with you. Even when we make really bad choices. He doesn't leave. Although it's really easy to complain when we find ourselves in those places. Israel certainly did, didn't they? Like day one, after they, they get pulled out of Egypt by God through a mighty hand. Do you remember that? Like in Exodus, it's amazing. God like literally reaches down and pulls them out of Egypt. Day one, after they're pulled out, they start complaining. They complain all the way through the desert to the mountain of God all the way through a wilderness to the threshold of the promised land. You remember this? And then they get to the threshold of the promised land and they complain about that too. And Moses recounts this to them. In Deuteronomy, starting in chapter 1, if, if you're not familiar with Deuteronomy and you're not kind of well-versed in the Old Testament, you don't know what it is, uh, the Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. It, it's basically where, where Moses recounts the last 40 years to Israel, uh, what they had gone through in the wilderness, and, and the, the law gives it to them again. And he stands before these people, the Israelites, as they are about to step for the first time into the promised land. After 40 years, when they were there in the exact spot, they refused to go in. And Moses recounts this to them. He says, do you remember the first time we were here? In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 22 to 28. And every one of you came near me and said, let us send men before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us of the way by which we should go up and of the cities into which we shall come. The plan pleased me well. So I took 12 of your men, one man from each tribe, and they departed and went up into the mountains. They came to the valley of Eshel and spied it out. They also took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us. And they brought back word saying, It is a good land which the Lord, our God, is giving us. Nevertheless, you would not go up. But you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God and you complained in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, He's brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying the people are taller, greater than we. The cities are 
great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there, basically giants. It's too hard. There's too many obstacles. Let me tell you something. When things get really hard, it's super easy to focus on what we're going through instead of where we're being led to. So easy to focus on what you're going through. They say this is too hard for us. Don't lose sight of what Israel could not grasp. Moses says to them, just listen. Deuteronomy 1, 29 to 31, Then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, He will fight for you according to all He did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. They missed it. It had nothing to do with them. They were so focused on the obstacles that were keeping them out of the promised land. So focused on the impossibility of them overcoming. They couldn't see it. The promise God had made to them had nothing to do with their abilities, but had to do with God's abilities. Had nothing to do with them being able to overcome. It had to do with with God. It was God who was with them in the wilderness. And God who had led them through the desert. It was God who was going to fight for them. It was God's will that they were going to be victorious. The same God of miracles that had already fought for them would continue to fight for them. But they couldn't focus on it. Instead, they, they focused on what they couldn't do. We can't overcome these obstacles. We're not strong enough. So we're not going to try. They didn't get it. The only thing they had to do was respond in faith and obedience. But they didn't get it, did they? They, they thought it was all up to them. They thought, if we have to go in there, we're going to have to fight. We're going to have to conquer it on our own because God is not really there. That, that's their, their thought process here. Their response was faith and obedience. That's our response. Like when, when we think about this, it's easy to think the same way as them. Like we can't overcome. Like we're not strong enough. Why should we even try? Well, that's not reality. God is so for us. He wants us to overcome, even in a wilderness. Maybe especially in a wilderness. That same God, the God of miracles, has already fought for you. He has fought a way through the most desolate wilderness that you could ever imagine. Winning over sin and death, things that we could never conquer on our own by the blood of Jesus Christ who atones for our sin. Our response is one of faith and obedience in that fact that that God made a way through Jesus Christ into the promised land of the kingdom of God. Do you really think, this is important, do you really think that a God who has fought that hard for you, who has gone that far for you, who has who has seeked after you, sought you that much, is going to give up now? He's not. He never will. He keeps fighting. We keep following. They couldn't see that. They didn't get it. So God says, you missed the point. Take a few laps in the wilderness, like 40 years of laps. In Deuteronomy 2.1, Then we turned and we journeyed into the wilderness of the way of the Red Sea as the Lord spoke to me and we skirted Mount Seir for many days. They turned and they journeyed into the wilderness. You know, they might have felt like God left them in the dust. I I can't blame them. I really can't blame them. I would have felt that way. Because this happened before. Like you're on the door of something great. Like all the beautiful expectation in the world, all the hope in the world, and all of a sudden you take a hard left and you find yourself in the desert. 
You left me in the dust, God. I felt that way. Have you felt that way before? You don't need to raise your hand. I felt that way before. That's not the truth. Moses explains to them the reality of what had really gone on there in Deuteronomy 2.7. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He knows you're trudging through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. What have you lacked? You have lacked nothing. Now, do you think they thought they lacked nothing? No. No, they had seen the promised land. They had seen everything that was there. Crystal clear. Their lack had never been more clear after seeing what they should have gone into. We know this because they were constantly complaining. Constantly complaining. The the gifts that they expected from God were now being withheld. The gifts from God were seemingly more important to them than God. If the gifts from God start to become more necessary to you than your relationship with Him, there's a good chance that you might be heading into a wilderness. I'm going to say that again. If the gifts from God start to become more necessary to you than your relationship with Him, there's a good chance you might be going into a wilderness because God loves you enough to want a real relationship with you. He's willing to remove the things that we have put between us and Him to give that the best chance of happening. But when it does happen, and you feel like those things that you deserve are being withheld, that can be hard. Like you, you start to think yourself maybe a little bit ill-used. I'm just going to be honest with you right now. If I was Moses, Moses is a much better man than me. Is anybody uh, feeling that way about Moses? I mean, he does call himself the humblest man that ever lived, right? But <laughs> maybe he's not wrong because he's a much better man than I am. Because if I was Moses, I'd feel that way. You spend 40 years in Egypt. You make one mistake. Okay, you kill a dude. But one mistake. And then you spend 40 years on the backside of nowhere. God finally calls you out. You finally get a purpose. He lets you lead people out of Egypt. Then you patiently intercede for them all the way through the desert to the promised land. And you're right there. And then, because of a mistake that they make, you get to spend 40 more years in the desert. You finally make it back to where you were 40 years earlier. And because you struck a stone instead of spoke to it, and that's actually really important. That's a whole message on why that's important. One mistake, and now you don't get to go in. One mistake in 80 years. Listen to Moses plead with God in Deuteronomy chapter 3, 23 to 27. Then I pleaded with Yahweh at that time, saying, Oh Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on the earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I love that, right? He's buttering God up. You know, if you want a a model for how to pray, start by praising God. Then thank Him. With prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And the peace of God shall guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. Start by, by thanking God for what He's already done for you. Man, if we just get our minds right about that. Praising Him. I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains and Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. The Lord said to me, 
enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. Go to the top of Pishgah and lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south, the east. Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. Have you ever put yourself there in his position? Is that heartbreaking to you? When you read the word of God, do you actually put yourself there? Or is it just words? Put yourself here. If you're Moses, after 120 years, 40 years of following God consistently well, this is heartbreaking. Are you angry? Are you resentful? Blaming God a little bit. What are you told? The very next verse. Verse 28. But command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him. For he shall go over before this people. And he shall cause them to inherit the land which you will see. Now I told you, Moses is a much better dude than Brandon. Moses takes this. He goes, all right. Ho, 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 ho. Not Brandon. No, Brandon be mad. Wait, what? This guy gets to go? He didn't lead these people. I led these people. I deserve to go in way more than this guy gets to deserve to go in. That's how I would be feeling. Sorry, just to be honest with you. Because it's super hard, super hard, super lonely when we are still in a wilderness and we see someone else getting out of it. It can make you bitter. Has that ever happened to you? You start to feel like, why am I still here and they get to go out? Maybe I deserve it more. It's very hard to encourage someone else when we feel like we are stuck someplace and they're moving forward. It's really hard to do that. It can make you bitter. It can make you blame God. But remember, everybody has their season in the wilderness. Every single person will have one. And something that came to me just a couple days ago, your wilderness doesn't have to look anything like someone else's wilderness. What might be a wilderness for you is easy for them. What might be easy for you is a complete wilderness for them. We all have seasons in it. And Moses is told, encourage Joshua, even though you're not going to get to do what you think you deserve to get to do, and he does. It's super hard to encourage someone when you see them getting to do what you think you deserve to do. But that was God's will for Joshua. And now Moses is told, encourage Joshua, just like we're called to encourage one another in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Therefore, comfort The word means encourage and exhort. Comfort one another. Encourage one another. Exhort one another. And edify one another. Just as you are doing. Part of how a wilderness shapes us is to teach us to encourage others. Even when they get to do things we think we deserve. How to encourage other people even when we are experiencing a lack. Man, i got to think of Paul here. Have you, have you read 2 Corinthians? Like, I think it's chapter, yeah, chapter 11, 23 to 28. Paul starts talking about what he's gone through. Now, these are some wildernesses. He says, are, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, beyond measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times, I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and the day I have been in the deep. In journeys, often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and toil. In sleeplessness, often. In hunger and thirst. In fastings, often in cold and nakedness, beside the other things, what comes upon me daily. My deep concern for all the churches. That sound like a wilderness to you? Let's see, that's lack, that's abandonment, that's discomfort, that's discouragement, like that's danger. 
Now, it took Paul a long time to learn this. This is not a rookie. This is not a novice. He didn't learn it right away, I don't think. But he learned it. Listen to what he learned in Philippians 4, 11 and 12. I take great encouragement with this. Not that I speak in regard to need. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Maybe you haven't learned that yet. That's okay. God's patient in guiding us. I have not learned. I have not attained this. I still get mad when I don't have what I want. You saw the kids with the toys. They wanted the toys. I took them away. Ah, I'm still that way. I have not learned to be content in every situation. But God is patient. God will guide you. He will teach you that you can rely on Him. Paul had learned this. I thank God that is not immediately given because if I don't have it, there's still hope for Brandon. That we can still learn this. He says, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Part of what our time in the wilderness teaches us is how to be content, how to rely on God. That is exactly why Israel was sent into the wilderness. Moses tells him so in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, you shall remember, in verse 2 and 3, you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commands or not. So He humbled you. He allowed you to hunger and fed you. Did He starve them? No, He never starves us. He allowed them to hunger and fed you with manna that you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that He might make you know. That man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. It is no coincidence that Jesus, when he's in the wilderness, facing temptation with nothing around, responds to Satan by quoting this verse of why Israel was led into the wilderness. That's in verse 4. But Jesus answered Satan saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word Of God, He's led by the Spirit into the wilderness to test Him, to tempt Him. Jesus still relied on this relationship with God and with the Word of God. Yeah, He was hungry. God gives us so much more than bread. I'll tell you what, I was really hungry when we moved up here. Really hungry. Not physically hungry, but I was longing for all the things that I I used to be able to rely on. I felt like I was starving because those things were not there anymore. Uh, I was really angry. Wasn't I angry? Going for confirmation here. (laughs) Just tell you, I was angry. I was bitter and I was blaming God. Because if you're anything like me, when you feel God leading you to somewhere... I don't know why, but I always think the somewhere is going to be great and the path is going to be a piece of cake. I I was naive, more naive than I am now, and I was disappointed. It forced me to my knees. It forced me to cry out to God who I hoped would still be around for me after blaming him for everything that I had blamed him for. He was. He answered. You know what he didn't do? He didn't give me all the things that I thought I was lacking. He did show me that all the things that I thought I was lacking were absolutely nothing compared to him and were all satisfied in a relationship with him. And he was the only one I could really, truly rely on. It wasn't fun. It hurt. And I did not enjoy it. But I learned. Maybe you're hungry today. 
Like I'm starving. God never starves us. He never starves us. He provided manna for Israel for 40 years. And he provides so much more for us. He provides what we actually hunger for. He provides himself. Just listen to John 6, 32 through 35. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. That's the manna. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. What we really hunger for is him. Don't feed yourself trash from the world when you have the bread of life in Jesus Christ. True life does not come from the world, but from His Word. Read His Word. Make the time to read the Word of God. When you do, remove the distractions. Focus on it. Not trying to rip through Scripture because it's your job. Read it not out of obligation, but as a blessing. Because the Word of God will bless you. Let the Word of Christ dwell richly in you. Let the Word of God abide in you. In the midst of your temptation, He will bring that to mind. The Word of God is a blessing. It is living. It is active. It will lead you into truth. It will guide you in your wilderness. It is proof that God will not abandon you in your wilderness. And just like Israel, if God leads you into a wilderness, He will powerfully show you that you can rely on Him. And He will lead you out. God powerfully uses people who have learned to rely on Him. Maybe maybe you... You're not in the wilderness right now. Maybe you know someone who is. Praise God you're not in the wilderness right now. Praise God He's shown you people who are, that you have that level of discernment. Encourage them. It is hard and it is lonely when someone's in a wilderness. You know this because you have been in one yourself. Encourage them. Make the time for coffee. Make the time for a phone call or just to text. Anything. Encourage them. What is not encouraging? What is not encouraging is blaming someone for the wilderness that they are in. That is not encouraging. Well, you're only here because you've done this to yourself. You've made these choices, and now you're in a wilderness. Don't you think they know that? That might be completely 100% true, but how many times... Have we made our own choices and found ourselves someplace completely terrible? We can absolutely create our own wildernesses. Maybe that's exactly what they've done. They've pushed away everything good in their life by chasing a lie of the world straight into the desert. But isn't God there too? Doesn't He still redeem? Isn't he still for us? Can't we still rely on him? Encourage someone in their wilderness that God has not abandoned them. That he's still God. He still loves them. He is still for them. And by following Jesus Christ, he will lead them out of the wilderness again. Because he will do that. Maybe you are in the wilderness You woke up one day in the middle of a desert and you're blaming God a little bit. Super common, super easy to do. I think maybe we've all done that a little bit. Let it go. Let it go. Press in to what God is trying to show you there. Trusting in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. He is shaping you. He is honing you into a weapon to be used against the enemy 
so that you can stand, if you didn't know this, that you can stand in the spiritual battle that is raging around you. No one ever takes an untested weapon into war. Would you ever take a gun that you had never shot into a battle? No one ever does that. No, God shapes us that we become a powerful weapon when used in the hands of an almighty God. He has not abandoned you. He will test whether you are his. He will test what you are relying on. If those things are not God or things that don't come from God, yeah, he might remove them. He will test whether you want a relationship with him or just the things that come from him. But he's still there. He still loves you. He's still working on you. He is always with you because he loves you. Look at the care that he's taken in shaping you, shaping you this far. The provision that he's already given you. What he's pulled you out of. And when he does pull you out of that wilderness, and he will, look back. Look back at the path, the clear path that he's made. And the perseverance that he's instilled in you so that you can remember that he works things for your good. Because God has called you. And even if that is into a wilderness for a season, take great hope that God cares for you enough to do some of his best work in the wilderness so that he can use you in this world for his kingdom. Let's pray.